Okay, welcome back. It's Henry Weston's Old Mate, the podcast. We are back with uh, another episode. We've got Stuart with us today. Hi, Stu. Hello, Phil. Hello. Uh, you've recovered from your near fatal dose of uh, man flu. How how were you uh, convalescing after that? Ah, oh, you know what? I, I I survived. Only just touch and go. But yes, antibiotics and everything. I am back at I reckon ninety five percent. So whether I'm ever at hundred percent could be argued. So yeah, fit as a butcher's dog, as they say, mate. Good, good, and still sober. Yes, very sober. Yeah, yeah. Sober, very sober, uh, mentally stable and sober. Very good. Very good. And uh, anybody that's watching on YouTube will notice uh, a, a voyeur in the corner there. Uh, we've got a special guest. It's Chris Walton. Hi, Chris. Hi, Phil, my brother. <laughs> really weird. <laughs> like, I've got a special I'm, voice, I'm, just me. I know, I know, I know. It's my, uh, my, my podcast voice. Um, so yeah, full disclosure, Chris is my older brother. Um, Although you wouldn't so, know, I know. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. We'll try and keep try and keep the in jokes to a minimum and the bickering as well. Um, so um, Chris is here because um, of his professional background, which kind of leads into um, some themes that we've been talking about since the new year. So um, over the last couple of weeks, we've been discussing about goal setting, not necessarily in respect of New Year's resolutions, but certainly in kind of uh, personal growth and things that we want to achieve through the year. And then off the back of that, we also talked about kind of failure, our response to failure, defining success, all those sorts of things. And uh, Chris is here because he's got um, a background in uh, strength and conditioning, personal training, and um, kind of the, the mental side of that. So um, Chris, just give us a little bit of a, for, for listeners, stroke viewers, a little bit of, give us your CV, essentially. <laughs> What's there? <laughs> a brief, brief summary of 25 years. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, how long have you got? It should have been the answer there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, keep, I'll keep it really brief. So, like Phil said, and first of all, thanks for having me on, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to kind of come on and chat. And I think what you do is great. So, um, yeah, I've been, I've been looking forward to, to talking and, and hopefully, you know, adding a bit of value to what you do. Um, so, yeah, just very briefly and without trying to bore people, I, yeah, studied sports science, got into personal training, moved to London. Um, did that for a little bit and then I was, I was lucky, uh, got an opportunity to work in professional sport, which is what I wanted to do, but I didn't really have a plan for how to get there. Uh, started working in cricket, first of all, and then it became uh, an opportunity in professional boxing and then I worked in professional rugby and along the way, you know, a few other bits and pieces, a bit of Formula One, a bit of athletics, a bit of judo, rowing, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of stuff there, but primarily it was boxing and, and rugby union um got you know strength and conditioning is 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 one thing but it's you end up as a strength and conditioning coach or part of a strength and conditioning team looking a lot after the mental health of the athletes you spend a lot of time with them you're there to put an arm around them to help them out you're doing we're discussing a lot around nutrition and lifestyle factors and one thing i found is, is it's a it's a holistic approach you, you can't just look at one thing you know my my sort of goal with working with people was to make them healthy first and foremost, because they were going to get the best results in their training if they were healthy. So my goal with regards to their lifestyle and, and nutrition and their mental health was to make sure that all of that was in a good space so that they could get the best possible performances and the best possible training um, to get the best possible performances. Um, I sort of left that behind when we had our second child because it's, uh, I guess, a, a young man's game in terms of there's a lot of travel involved. Um, got back into the personal training industry, worked in numerous places, consulted for lots of different people, working with from anywhere from cancer clinics, working with people on exercise programs for, for, for their patients, right the way through to kind of you know body transformation gyms and, 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 and all the rest of it. So yeah, brief sort of summary there. I, I too do a podcast. We have a fitness consultancy business and uh, yeah, so I know that uh, what goes into making one of these. So um, yeah, hats off to you guys. Right, sorry. It it wasn't in the uh, in the pre podcast contract that you were allow allowed to kind of advertise your your, uh, your pod. So we need to we're going to edit that bit out. Um, <laughs> we'll, include, we'll include a link. 
yeah. <laughs> you probably know you're probably not going to be interested so it's totally unrelated but anyway thanks no that's and i think it, you know that synopsis just really kind of uh really feeds into where we've been so far through our kind of couple of months uh, of this year with what we've been talking about in terms of just yeah development growth um and and where we're going to go with that so Stu, uh, was there anything that anywhere you particularly wanted to start or are we just going to just do quick fire questions? <laughs> no, no, nowhere particular. Before we get fully going, and it's it's good that Chris mentioned that he'd done some work within sort of cancer clinics there, because I did just want to mention my mum, uh, who is doing, she is walking all over cancer in March. My poor old dad has been battling terminal lung cancer for, for a few years now. He's still going. She's going to walk. 10,000 steps a day in March. She's doing some wonderful work. We'll link the page. Just thought I'd get that in there. Um, but no, um, I'm not really sure where right. you're going to start, Phil. Uh, I, will, <laughs> I will tag along for the ride. Okay, so let, let's just start then, because I think one of the things that we, the, the, the focus for this episode was going to be very much around it's that hinterland in the year where we've made some goals in January whether they're New Year's resolutions or whether they're just things that we want to achieve. Um, and um, February is that kind of time where it's either going really, really well and you're enthusiastic to the to the end or it's not going as well as you would expect it. Now, whether that's a weight loss or whether you've not quite run the distance or whether you, you know, haven't, you're not fluent in French yet or whatever it is. February is that time where you either jack it in and go, I messed that up, it's not working, or you you keep going. And I think part of having Chris on the call was going to be very much around, for those people that are struggling, how do you regain that motivation? What else do you need to do to kind of get back on the horse? And it kind of feeds into that failure conversation that we had before where people kind of go, I'm not fluent in French, and they forget about how much that they learned in that point so kind of almost acknowledging the successes within the within the apparent or perceived failure so yeah. in that context for you chris then i guess the, the first thing is in your work you will have seen people who just kind of are either disheartened or unmotivated because their progress has not met their expectations What's that conversation like from your side when you are met with a client or a sports person in that mindset? Um, what's the conversation like? Well, first of all, I try really hard not to be sarcastic because I've probably told them what they should have done and they didn't do it. So um, I, I try my hardest not to be like that. No, I mean, I think, you know, sort, sort of joking aside from that from that point of view, I think there's there's lots of literature out there. There's lots of, you know, this is how you should set goals. This is how you should set uh, New Year's resolutions. And I think the problem is in 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 using the plural when you're talking about resolutions. I think people, first and foremost, I think that that's one of the big problems. So, you know, people will put a big list together of things that they want to change. And we know, I, I shared briefly before we started, Stu, with uh, a book called Atomic Habits, which is probably a, one of one of the best books on habit formation and habit change out there and the science behind it and it's kind of clear to understand and, and oh, sorry, easy to understand and kind of gives you clear steps to being able to do that but one of the big sort of golden rules there and one of the things that we really know about habit formation is that when you try and change too many things at once you invariably fail and there's a stat in there and I can't remember exactly what it is but if you were to try and change two things you would be 50 percent less likely to succeed at either of them three and it becomes 33 percent four and it's a 25 percent job so you know you're you're actually diminishing your chances the more things you add into the mix so i think the first problem that people have is that they they try they're too ambitious they try to change too many things at once and i think that's really probably quite frustrating for people to hear because we get all motivated and 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 it's funny that we do it at that, this time of year and it's almost become a, a thing you know and it shouldn't we shouldn't have to wait till till then to change it 
um, but it's like it's an expected thing and then everyone gets really keen and I'm really motivated so I'm going to change loads of different things and you know I already know that from your previous podcast you know you, that you've, you you want to learn French and you're going to cook more healthy meals to you and we'll probably talk about <laughs> later on so there's already two things there and like you might say Okay. Oh, this isn't going well for me already. <laughs> <laughs> and, and listen, listen, like they're totally separate things. And I'm not saying that you can't have multiple ones, but, you know, there are certainly things that you can do to mitigate against fa- failing in any of those things. And obviously, you know, I'm not saying that you should just concentrate on one until you've become completely fluent in French. But what you should do probably is concentrate on one thing until that becomes a habit and it's no longer having to be a conscious thing that you have to work really hard at trying to achieve and it's almost like rather than I want to learn French it's it's I want to begin to start to learn it almost or I want to continue learning it or whatever and it's like a it's that there's a never-ending goal there's a there's a purpose there that's ongoing and it's infinite um you know so 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 because I think and and again we're slightly going off topic and I'll try and sort of bring it back in a second but quite often we set a goal and it's a there's a finite end point there and it's like well what happens after that you know you hear often about olympic athletes who suddenly you know achieve their life ambition of olympic gold and they're really disappointed and really unfulfilled because you know we, we say it a lot you know it's about the journey and and, and it really is you know that, that it's, at, it's actually about having a purpose so what is your purpose in all of this? And, and, and you know, having an infinite purpose. And again, I'm going to sort of name check another book. So start with why, which is uh, Simon Sinek, which people could probably have a look at. And then it, I almost think the, the follow up book to that is the, um, um, the Infinite Game um, by the same author, which talks a lot about having this infinite purpose. So, <clears throat> so anyway, so, yeah, back to the original sort of point, you know, the conversations that I often have are around people trying to be too ambitious and, and, and I get it we all want to change things and we want to and we're impatient to get to that end point we want to achieve those results so clearly it's a let's attack it from all sides thing you know and there's lots of things we want to work on but I think it's probably good to try and narrow it down work on you know some slightly smaller things and we'll talk about this in, in a second but but not not be too ambitious basically i guess is is, is the first point there uh, is the so just going back to something you said right at the beginning is the if you're trying to take on too many things like you talked about you, you essentially halving your chances of success by the, every time you add a new kind of goal or or, or target is that is the reason for that around capacity like you just you're trying to do too much or you just can't you, there's too many habits to change what's yeah. the yeah the, 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 there'll be it's, be it's because of capacity yeah there's too many things to change there and the body is a, a habitual being you know we get into these habits these routines we like these routines and once you're in them it's it's, it's actually quite hard to change things you know yeah. so so it does come down to capacity yeah so and, and, and you know we, again we spoke we spoke a little bit earlier so if you don't if you set yourself up to fail by trying to do too many things and we're all busy and we've got lots of things to try and do invariably you drop the ball at some point so then you don't get the expected outcome therefore you get demotivated therefore you fail okay so it should be around you know, trying to set yourself up to be able to do these things and make them make them a habit, make them something you're not even having to think about. And we can talk about what that actually looks like and we can potentially, you know, go through an example maybe later on or or whatever. Yeah. But then just so, to be very, sorry, go on. yeah, go on. I was gonna move us on. So if you've got if you've got something that you want to just pick up on what you've just said, then fine. No? no. Okay. So um I'm actually just you've said something else that I, I don't want to lose because I think there's a real to bring this back to kind of where we started with this podcast um, back in the day, back in the day um, with Stu's kind of recovery is uh, you've said a really interesting point about like com- comparing it with Olympic athletes that when they get that gold and now what? And I think. I just want to kind of draw a parallel to recovery from alcohol for you, Stu. 
Yeah. The goal was stop drinking or die. Okay, and that was that's where you were in your hospital bed. Yeah, yeah. But but then the and then what is very much up to you. And I wonder whether there is something around kind of like how do you define your purpose as a recovering alcoholic in that short, medium, and long term position because you, you're now kind of I don't know I'd say you're probably towards the end of the medium term being at where you are in your recovery but yeah. finding a purpose because you know you never went into stopping drinking thinking that you were going to there, there was I, I guess there was no forethought after the first couple of weeks get the first couple of weeks out of the way and then get the next couple of months out of the way and then yeah you know what I'm trying to say yeah and it's we've we've sort of something we've sort of discussed across a, a variety of podcasts isn't it that those sort of that initial period of uh make or apologizing trying to make amends to everyone that was always going to happen but was was actually has been sort of proven or been described to me you know it didn't really do me any good but it's it's natural you know that's a natural feeling you know that 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 week or two afterwards sort of try and make amends and then very early on in AA it was sort of you know um told to me suggested to me that I had to get sober for me I had to put me first in the immediate short term because I'm no good to you know if I if I stop drinking for my wife and my daughter for my friends or my family eventually I was going to have an argument with my wife and think well sod you you know and and have a drink again so I had to I had to get sober for me in the short term and then that sort of middle ground like you say we're coming to the end of now um potentially is you know things like this I'm I'm in the we're in the sort of I'm in that period of trying to give back but that that needs to be forever um but yeah i mean i again i've said before had i been single um i don't i don't know if i'd have if my sobriety would have been quite so successful because that may sound strange because i have just said i had to get sober for me but i think there needed to be once i achieved that having the outside motivational factors of a wife and a child and you know and my parents and, and my brothers I was still lucky enough to have a job um they were factors that I could then throw myself back into I didn't necessarily have to go and find a reason the reasons were there you know they'd been blurred and I'd put a lot of them on the back burner with my you know I prioritized my alcohol consumption ahead of everything but I was fortunate in a sense that I had a life that I had chosen to put on hold but I could then if I wanted to and again I had to want to but I could then jump back in I was you know I still had a job I was lucky I could get back into work my wife you know stayed with me so I could Mm. then get back into working on my marriage you know it it needed a lot of work after obviously the problem Um, I don't know if that answers the question but no, I think it does. I, th- I think as you've been talking, I've been thinking what a stupid question it was, um, because, you know, the decision about stopping drinking is was. It, it was kind of quite a binary position. You either stop drinking or you don't and you remain an, an active alcoholic or a recovering yeah. alcoholic. And then kind of <laughs> what's your purpose? It's like I'm going to be a husband and I'm yeah. going to be a, a father that you know, by your own admission, you, you, you know, weren't functioning where, where you could have been or where you should have been. So, yeah. um, like you say, picking up where you wanted your life to go in the absence of alcohol um, was probably that purpose. And then kind of the, the discovery phase that you're in at the moment, I guess, is how you can give back and how you can make that last in the long term as well. Yeah. And again, that's, that ha- that's that's a choice that I have made, but through, you know, the reading and the podcast that I listen to, the podcast that we do, you know, I think it's anyone who has read anything about sort of 
a recovery it's it's a valuable tool really being or the want to give back and being able to you know we, we we've done this off our own backs but there would have been maybe slightly smaller ways i could you know i could have done it by offering service within aa meetings for example i could have attended two or two or three aa meetings a week and offered service but in many ways i could have done it but but yeah yeah Okay, good. Well, I'm glad we went there because I, I was just uh, kind of uh, it jumped out at me as a as a yeah that where that where where's your why and that and that purpose. But just bringing it back into um, kind of Chris with the so you talked about some of those examples that we gave and Stu is is there for kind of uh, easy pickings because he set up some goals for the year and by your again by your own admission some of them are not going quite so well. <laughs> but I think there's an opportunity here to use those as a as a you know if we're going to help somebody get back on kind of the right track and where they're going to go some of the detail and some of the considerations that need to be brought into that discussion in order to actually get you where you want to be so yeah. I, I, Let's go. We, we've talked about the, the, the French and, yeah, you know, well, let's, yeah, let, 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 let me dive into it then. So, I mean, I, I, just to be clear, by the way, I, I mentioned earlier, like if you try and change too many things at the same time, you set yourself up for failure. I think it is still possible. And, 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 and I think, you know, you'll find from if you ever read this book um, that, uh, that, it, that it is possible to do different you know, to work on different goals. I think it's when, we, when we're trying to change, like if people are like, oh, I want to lose weight and they give up smoking, drinking, start doing exercise and change their diet. They're four things that are all heading towards the same goal, if you see what I mean. That's where you come into, that's, that's where you, you, you head into problems. You know, learning French stroke, I want to cook healthier meals for the family is, is slightly different. You could probably do those concurrently. Now, like I said, like we talked about framing things before, Phil, but, you know, I think a good example of having a sort of a, a, a purpose, a higher purpose, that, um, Simon Sinek calls it in his book, um, with regards to the, the cooking example is I want my family to be as healthy as possible rather than I'm going to cook healthy meals for my family. It's I actually want my family to be as healthy as possible and give them the best possible chance in in life or whatever okay so whatever it is that you want to frame it as so start with that first of all because actually when you're questioning have i got time to do this it's like well actually like this is quite important to me that my family are healthy and this is one of the things i need to do in order to get them there um sorry phil the original question was around how do we get the minutiae how do we plan for these things right and, and well it, it was but i think you touched on something that kind of brings brings it all to life in respect of um why am i doing this yeah. you know and you've got why am i doing it and the reframing is always very subtle and nuanced but saying i want my kids or my family to have a healthy meal sounds very different to i want my my family to be healthy and there's something i can do about that so it's rather than just the individual meal this is all about setting their health in the right direction because obesity, diabetes, all of that shizzle is, you know, a big killer in the country. Yeah. So the reframing makes a massive difference. And then you can start peeling the layers back. We'll use that analogy, the cooking analogy, as it's an onion, and we can peel those layers back and um, get into the real detail of how. Yeah. We've got the why, but how? Yeah, exactly. So you've got the why, and like you say, you've got that purpose. And, 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 and I guess... Uh, uh, potentially a sort of another way of looking at it is is sort of I don't know reverse engineering from your end point but there isn't really an end point here the end point is kind of you know optimal health for my family but like right how do we get to that point okay so let's work back from that point what does that look like and what things do we need to do in order to get to that point and it's about having milestones and markers along the way so for instance, I know, I know with, with your, your healthy meal example, let, let, let's say you, you look at it and you go, right, at the moment we cook no healthy meals. So one healthy meal a week is gonna be an improvement. But realistically, what can I do there? Let's say it's two or three, okay? It doesn't matter what the number is. Let's say it's two or three healthy meals. Okay, great. Now, if you just set that as your goal, 
how likely is that 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 you're going to be able to achieve that okay so let's say a friend phil phil heads heads into you know your vicinity and he says oh do you want to come out and let's 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 go out for a meal somewhere and then all of a sudden you can't you know that's the night you're going to cook a healthy meal that gets put to one side then you're working late something else crops up etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know quite often these things fall by the wayside unless it's clearly defined what we're going to do and when we're going to do it so i think that's that it all comes down to the planning of it so what i would do is i'd work back from that i'd say right so three three meals okay so which three meals are they going to be and on, on, you know you might have to spend half an hour on a sunday identifying look at your calendar the week ahead and the calendar becomes a really important part of it calendar the week ahead which three meals are we going to do here this one this one this one great right now what do i need to do in order to be able to cook those meals i need to have the correct ingredients i need to know what it is i'm cooking first of all actually i need to have the correct ingredients for it and i need to have time to prepare it and cook it okay so let's actually start right at the very beginning then in order to in order to decide what meals you're going to have, you're going to need to sort of spend 10, 15 minutes planning the meals. Now, it might be that it's the same three meals. We often eat this, the same 10 meals, I think, is the stat. OK, yeah. so but but, you know, so it's just swapping things around, you know, every Friday it's fish and, you know, traditionally and all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, choose choose what it is you're going to. We need to plan. We need to sit down and actually plan out the meals. And if you're doing this over a seven day period, you'd need to plan every single evening meal. Right. But it would take 15 minutes to do that. It's not that difficult to do. And then you need a shopping list. OK, so you plan your list. OK, so in order to make that meal, I need these things. And then so so that's that's but I would diarize that. I would actually put that in my diary in your, your phone. Your you know, reminder comes up three o'clock on a Sunday, plan and prepare meals or whatever it is. OK, there's your cue to do it and then becomes a habit. Then in my diary, I'm going to plan when I'm going shopping Monday night, I'm going shopping or whatever it is, you know. Sunday, it could be, you know, you do your planning on Saturday afternoon and you do your shopping on Sunday. Sunday, I'm planning it. It's going in the diary. It's this time we're going to do it. So you go and or you go and organize and, and get get your uh, get your shopping in. You've got your ingredients and then I'm going to organize. Potentially, I might even spend half an hour. What can I prep now? Could I actually prep loads of veg, chop it up, stick it in Tupperware containers, stick it in the fridge? And it becomes all of a sudden. It's like probably an hour and a half of your weekend where if you diarise it and plan it, you're really setting yourself up. And that might sound like the biggest pain in the backside to lots of people, but you're going to do these things anyway. Yeah. You are going to cook. You are going to be preparing. You are going to um, go shopping. OK, you might not be planning at the moment, but you're going to be planning probably in your head, but you're not actually writing it down in paper. So you are doing these things anyway. So how can you make it easy on yourself? And give yourself the best possible chance of achieving what you need to achieve, which which if your you know, your your higher purpose and your sort of end result is to achieve optimal health for your family. This is important to you. So presumably you've got that time to spare just to put it to one side, stick it in your diary. And if you put it in the diary, it's likely to happen. And if something crops up, what you're likely to do is reschedule it. Which also means that it will probably happen. Now, yeah. I can't really help if we get to the stage where like you're just putting everything off. It means you don't really want to do it and it's not important enough to you. And that's a key thing. If it's not that important to you, which again goes back to the reframing or framing of it, Phil, if it's not important to you, you're probably not going to do it. You know, you stop drinking because it was important to you. OK, first and foremost, um, you know, so if it's not that important to you, you're not going to do it. So, you know, I can't really help if, if you know, you keep putting everything off and you're putting all the right structures in place. And then, you know, if it's not important to you, you're not going to it's not going to happen. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, no, it does. No, they think it's none of it is rocket science, is it? But it is about having going into that specific level of of detail and car making sure that you're carving out the time to achieve it so you know if you're like if we continue the co the cooking example the the best there will be a best time of the day to be cooking for the family obviously you want it around tea time um but you know if it's if it's doing a lot of the preparatory work if you haven't done it on the sunday or just starting things going diarising, carving out the time, whatever you want to call it, to, to have set times in the day. 
it's going to become a bit of a habit, hopefully without it being too um, kind of uh, static and, and kind of ruin it, like routine, set, setting a routine that's too inflexible for you yeah. as well. Because I think if you become a slave to it, you then start to resent it. Yeah, exactly. But I think a really good point on that, Phil, is is can you time stack things? So is there something that you're doing on a day to day basis that you could perhaps mix in with this? Now, I get up every morning and I like to make myself like I literally grind the beans. And I've got this aero press machine and I make myself a coffee and I sit there for 10, 15 minutes and I drink my coffee. OK, and I do that every morning religiously. It doesn't matter what time of the day I'm going to do that. Now, could I spend those 10, 15 minutes doing something else at the same time? 100% I could. Instead, I'm on the BBC website and I'm, you know, but I don't need to do that then. Could I, that, at that point, be making something, be whatever it is, whatever it is. You know, do you watch um, uh, Tipping Point at five o'clock every day? You know, and if that's something that you do and you're sat there, could you be doing something else at the same time? Can you make something efficient? You know, if it's a habit that you do and you never miss it, can you stack something else on top of it? Because that's good. That, that, that sort of thing is really powerful to help. And, you know, this sounds like I heard this myself a number of times before I actually took action on any of this sort of stuff. Um, and and it, it, so someone might be listening to this thinking, come on, this isn't realistic. But I, genuinely, this is, this, is, this is what I've seen as, 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 the, as the best way of making this sort of stuff stick. And people try... And, and they fail at it and they try and fail at it. And, and I totally understand that. I never expect people to get it first time now either because very few people do. Um, it's, it's, a, it's actually a skill. And, and again, reframing things. So when we're talking about failure and, oh, I'm rubbish, I, I can't do this. This is a skill. You know, planning and preparing like this is a skill. And we don't get to be really proficient at a skill unless we try and do it over and over again. And sometimes we're going to fail at that and we learn from it and we bring other things in. So, again, just, you know, reframing things, thinking about this as a skill means that, you know, when it does happen and you don't quite succeed at it, that's you learning how to do it better next time. Um, and right, what can I do here then? Let's review it. I've, you know, I've planned it. I've tried to do it. It hasn't worked. OK, let's review why it didn't work then. Am I being too ambitious? Is there something that I'm not doing right here? You know, what's what's the issue here? I'm not finding the time to do this. OK, well, how can I do that? Could I time stack it? Could could someone else help me? Could we do this together? That'd be a really good thing to do. You know, with the, with the cooking example, 100 percent. That could be really, could you do something with the kids? Could you do something with the, the wife, the, the husband, whatever, it, whoever, whoever it is, you know, to make that more likely to happen? Yeah. Yeah. yeah very good points. Excellent points, aren't they? Uh, but like you said, yeah. it's not rocket science. None of this is rocket science at all. It's, it's actually really simple, like ridiculously simple to talk about, but not to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's something that, uh, yeah, it, it's discipline, isn't it? This is the thing. It's about having discipline to, to commit to it, I think. Yeah. Um, and Just, that comes from how much does it matter to you? Yeah. And the discipline yeah. is... Discipline is a, it's a finite, you know, willpower and all the rest of it. It's a finite resource. So what's the backstop to that? And the habit is the backstop to that. So how can you get into the habit? And this is what we're talking about at the moment. We're talking, what we're doing here is we're trying to create habits. And the habit for you and the cue here, here is, is plan, for the first step in that habit is planning your, um, your meals and planning the time to go shopping and planning the time to prep it. And that's that's setting yourself up. Then everything else follows on from that. So that's that's it's, yeah. So that's that's the habit part that will be there when you know your willpower fails. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just something that you do. This is just what I do. I might yeah. Think about. I'll just I'll just put I'll just for people listening because because Chris has given an excellent explanation there. So if I just put my real time experience of how it's been in the last two weeks using my obviously we sort of said my want for all of us the three of us in my house to eat a bit healthier it was something for me but me and my wife had a conversation earlier in the year that we were slightly concerned we wanted our daughter's relationship with food to be a healthy one you know she's five and a half she's slim blah 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 but if she's anything like me 
and my wife, then she probably will be prone to gaining weight quite easily if she's not careful when she's older. So we, uh, maybe Chris might think he's, he's waffling there, he know better than me. But but if that's the way, it's, we wanted her to have a healthier relationship with food. So we got into a good habit. The problem I'm having now is I'm planning my meals. The problem we're now having is my wife's finish time at work is quite variable and she won't leave work until she's happy and that's throwing big spanners in so i don't i don't expect an answer to that but you know it's there's a knock-on effect i've we've we've sort of done two-thirds of you know i've done the shopping we do the shopping on a sunday we have the seven day or meal prep on the board and then life still throws another spanner and it's kind of I don't really want to have that argument. Can you please make sure you finish work at five? Because it throws it all down the fucking pan when you don't. <laughs> well, I, th- I, think the, just... I, think need, I think I think you need to frame it, Stu, of, uh, or, or ask her, how much do you really want to finish work on time? How important? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just that's just you know that's we that's that's not an excuse, but that is yeah. I, or, I, we. I'm doing well. I, we're doing quite well, but in the last couple of weeks, and there's always something. Life's always going to throw something, isn't there? But exactly. it, it, yeah. it really does. It can't. And, and as the guy sort of doing the, the the cooking, you then I have been guilty. I just think, well, next week on a Wednesday, if the meeting's going to overrun again, I'm just going to do chicken Kievs, and I'm going to wait till my wife's at Dover until I put them in the oven. But my problem is. I'm then doing chicken kiosks for another month. So what I probably need to do after that first week is step back and have that conversation that maybe I'm a bit scared of, potentially, to say it's maybe we'll just put dinner back 45 minutes. But, yeah. Yeah, and that, that's, that's something cold. That's, that's potentially one way of doing it. I guess another way would be just to accept that life does get in the way sometimes and just be like, you know, you, you've set a quite an, uh, an ambitious kind of routine there in that, you know, you, let's say every meal needs to be healthy. Well, it's like, well, yeah. that's probably not going to be realistic. Yes. Yeah. Get in the way. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, th- there are some practical things you could potentially do. So we're talking about preparing stuff. If Wednesdays are always going to be a problem, you know, we, we, we talk quite often about double, you know, cooking, cooking extra batches and sticking in the yeah. freezer. Yeah. You know, and if you're preparing stuff, it doesn't take really much longer to prepare twice the amount of food. And if no, we, we, we quite often um, eat the same sorts of meals. And, and there's loads of really good examples of stuff. And actually, quite often, some of this stuff tastes better when it's been cooked for the second time anyway. You know, curries <laughs> and things like that. We're constantly cooking it. So it's literally, I come in and we take, take curry out of the freezer and I'm just literally doing the rice. Um, and that's it. And it's 15 minutes to do the rice because it's a seven minutes with uh, one part uh, one part rice, four parts water, and then seven minutes to just with the lid on once it's boiled and, and done and everything just to, yeah, and it comes out nice and light and fluffy and all the rest of it. Uh, sorry, it's not one part rice, four parts water, it's one part rice, two parts water. Oh, uh, Jamie and Oliver and Joe Wicks are fucked after this episode. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie, <laughs> honestly, flawless every single time. Quarter of a quarter of a cup per person. Anyway, we digress. But you know, the the point is, the point is, is, is there that you could, you know, if if you're doing it once, actually make it really easy for yourself. Yeah. You know, so then m- maybe you only have to cook three times in a week, or because you know you've got w- w- once you've done a couple of weeks, you've got a bit of momentum. There's so this stuff in the freezer, and just get organised with the, your Tupperwares and labelling, and stuff like that. So it's just you know, there's the, the, there are some practical examples. I've actually got. Um, really good company that uh, really good nutrition company and they're really good on the 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 habit side of all of this um and they've got a cheat sheet for meal prep which i can i can share with you and we can potentially send the link um or, or whatever to, to to your listeners um yeah yeah cool it talks a lot about this sort of stuff um and, and making it easy on yourself because guess what everyone's having the same problems and, yeah and, yeah 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 okay so um one of the things that i wanted to 
touch on, I guess, um, and I know it doesn't sound like it to the listeners, but we we do did have a planning call uh, earlier in the day. Uh, so some of this was actually planned and others has gone off on a tangent, which is all very good because it's been really helpful. But I think there's um, something around um, when, like like Stu's just described and, and the way that you've just come at it as well, Chris, is that um, when it has hasn't gone to plan or you've reached a plateau and Stu and I discussed this on the, the failure episode of you know Stuart described it really quite nicely of uh, you know you set a target to go and climb Everest and you you get within 100 feet of it and that's classed as a failure without actually acknowledging quite how far you've managed to climb up the world um, and Chris when we discussed earlier on there was a, a whole context of you know is about trending really and I just wondered if you kind of we, we might have to switch the uh, switch the analogy away from cooking and maybe more onto kind of weight loss or training on those sorts of things but just accepting that when there is a plateau or a or things just aren't quite going to plan in in a weight loss scenario that people kind of go oh, I've not lost anything for three weeks I'm going to give up you know, yeah. or it's not not quite working. So just, I guess, a few, something around that really, just to kind of talk us through kind of the the trending and those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think sometimes it's it's uh, we, we we start talking about the trending thing because I think it was an example around oh, I want to lose two stone, and it's like okay, well, what, what happens when you've lost your two stone? Do you go back to eating sort of normally, whatever that looked like beforehand, which clearly wasn't what you wanted to do because you're trying to lose weight, so it wasn't working in inverted commas it wasn't where you wanted to be so it, it, it was yeah just trying to trying to get people to understand that first of all something like weight loss and and, it, and it's probably a really good analogy for absolutely everything else progress is never linear never ever in anything um you know so it's just getting comfortable with that thought process first of all and that and the the important thing is the are the habits and the skills and the behaviors over a long period of time so all the stuff that we've just talked about here getting those getting those things dialed in planning so that it becomes a habit so that then that's just what you do and then the results sort of take care of themselves if you're doing all of those things right um, and they will be trending in the right direction despite the fact that some weeks your weight might go up or you might not lose any weight but weight sorry but over a six month period you've lost 10 kilos um, albeit yeah. this week it, it's gone up a little bit you know so you've now lost nine kilos or whatever but you know over over time you still you know the trend curve is, is downward so I think yeah expectations these days and, and we can talk about social media and all the rest of it and you know film stars and look at the, you know the amazing shape that they're in for such and such got ready for this film and it took him six weeks and you know get great abs in six weeks on the front of men's health and all the rest of it that stuff's been going on for 20 years I've told the editors of those magazines what a load of rubbish anyway um you know the expectations are set really high for people and set to the to the extent that you know some people are never going to be able to do some of this stuff they're never going to have abs in six weeks never going to have abs um you know and, and and that's fine but why should they have anyway um but yeah I think you know expectations on people are are quite high or people set high expectations for themselves based on false things or things that are probably never going to be achievable or that they don't actually even care that much about it goes back to again that question as to why why are you doing this why why do you want to do this so you know rather than I want to lose two stone I would I would first of all be saying right I want to become more healthy and as part of that you know I need to find a healthy way but I'm not going to necessarily define that I'm going to look at other markers alongside that so it's not the only thing you know so yeah. I'm going to look at, you know how do I look how do I feel and quite often now you know when, when when I'm doing weight loss things with people a big focus is on their mood their sleep their energy levels you know how motivated are they in other areas of their life because if those things are all down then they're not eating enough food probably so and it's not healthy for them and it's not going to be sustainable so I need to get them to the point where everything's a four or five out of five my mood's good I'm happy I'm sleeping really well my energy levels are good 
and and oh yeah and i, I feel great and I've, oh, and I've and i've lost a little bit of weight so you know it's not just about the weight it's other factors as well um so that yeah when it does sort of start doing this a little bit they're not hugely disappointed and it's not just a short-term thing it's about okay we're trying to pin other things onto it so you eating in this way or behaving in this way has made you feel more energetic you've got a really you're in a really good mood you're highly motivated in all aspects of your life you're sleeping really well so why are we doing this it, it, it's for these things surely you know yeah. and you look a bit better okay great so tick that box as well it's not just pinned on one thing which is for a lot of people based on an unrealistic expectation yeah yeah and i think i've, I've kind of been we've spoken about this kind of um o- over the last couple of months but my my plan for the new year I'd, I'd wanted to drop some weight um and my higher being is that i couldn't afford a new wardrobe so my work clothes were just way too tight my suits are too expensive to replace and um yeah just wasn't a humble brag there um but there was just way <laughs> too too much going on from that point of view but when you've got a lot to lose it comes off fairly quickly and then it doesn't and i'd got to the point where i'd managed to lose I don't know, three kilos in a couple of weeks. And then fuck all happened. Like literally I was moving more, eating less, sleeping better and nothing was happening. And I just kind of got into that. Oh, come on. But like you've just described, actually by losing a couple of kilos, I was into into my work clothes as I wanted to be. But my sleep was that much better. I was actually going to bed tired waking up when the book hit me in the face because I'd only managed a, a two pages and then sleeping eight hours and that's that for the last year or so that's been unheard of and some of that's kind of COVID related but um, there has been a noticeable difference in things like sleep mood um, and energy as well as you know like I say I'm you know I, I need to redefine that higher reason now because I'm yeah. in my work clothes but yeah, yeah, you, you do. And you also, you know, just, just on that really quickly, I mean, because it's a real common one, so I might as well just cover it off. The body has a biological set point. So if you spent three years at a certain weight, body fat level, whatever, whether that's low or high, because we all know people that can eat loads and loads of crap food and they're super skinny, right? But that's because they've always been super skinny. and Because they're assholes. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, and we you, don't invite people like that on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But they can get away with eating that sort of stuff just because their biological set point is set at a certain point and it doesn't want to move away from that and it actually takes a lot for that to happen so what you described earlier phil where you lost three kilos fairly quickly and that's probably you know you might cut cut out certain food groups and there's water that's stored with carbohydrates so the weight often drops when, when you cut out you know when you start eating less of that sort of stuff and then you've reached the plateau and that plateau is your body going well i don't want to go away from this this is my biological set point so, but by carrying on and carrying on and carrying on, all of a sudden the body's sort of pulled further away from that, from that biological set point and then the elastic snaps and then it shifts a bit. And you see it really often with people's weight loss, it'll go steeply down and it'll plateau a bit and then it'll go, boom. And so, like, oh, what did you do there? You know, did you suddenly cut your calories in half? And it's like, no, I didn't do anything actually. It just went and I can't explain it. But, but yeah. that's the reason why it's a biological set point. So, this is why we have to focus not on the outcomes, but on the processes and, and understand that we're doing all the right things like the meal prep. That's the sort of stuff you need to focus on, like getting eight hours sleep, like making sure that you do three hours of exercise every week. It's the process goals along the way. And we didn't really talk enough about this probably, but rather than, and I'll, I'll expand on process goals in a second, but it's those those little things along the way, those actions and behaviours that are going to lead to the goal in the end. So quick, quick thing on process goals. Let's say you say to me, right, Chris, I want to save five grand this year. Great, great goal. That was the New Year's resolution. Great goal. How are you going to do it? Well, I'm just going to save up uh, 500 quid a month. You know, whatever 300, whatever it is, however much my math is terrible, whatever it is per month. Okay, well, how are you going to get to that? Ah, point? Good quid a week, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what, what are you going to do? What are you going to get? How are you going to get to that point? You know, well, you've either got to earn more money or you've got to make savings somehow. And people are like, well, I don't know, I'm just going to just save that money. 
it's like, okay, but we need to actually have a plan in place on a day-to-day basis. So what do you do on a day-to-day basis? Where are you spending your money? What can you do to impact on this? So let's focus on the process. So rather than saying, my goal is to save five grand or two and a half grand, let's say for ease of maths, because I've, I've done this, I've, I've prepared this. Um, in, what you could do instead is say, right, my goal on a day, five days a week, I am not going to have my three Starbucks or two Starbucks or whatever it is, three Starbucks. Okay, so let's say it's 10 or a day, 50 quid a week, 4.33 weeks in a month, that's £216.50 or whatever it is. Yeah, times that by 12, you've got two and a half grand. Okay, so rather than going, right, there's my two and a half grand, I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm going to try and save that. You've got to break it down into what are the things that I'm going to do on a day to day basis? What's my process goal? That's going to allow me to achieve that. So I'm not going to think about the two and a half grand. That's just going to be there at the end, but I'm working back from it. How do I hit that? This is how I hit it. I'm not going to have three Starbucks a day. I might make my own coffee at home. Okay. But obviously, obviously there's a cost associated there, but it will be, you know, 5% of the cost of the coffee in, in, uh, in Starbucks because the markups are massive. Um, so yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's an example of process goals and it'd be the same, like I said, with the, with the weight loss, rather than thinking about the outcome and just concentrating on that is right. What are the things that you are going to do to influence that on a day-to-day basis that are going to allow you to get there? And they're the things that need to be achievable. And they're the things that you need to work on the habits and the skills of in order to achieve that. Sorry, slight tangent again, but. No, no, and I think it's you know it it work it fits in really well because I think sometimes like if we go back to the kind of my weight loss experience, some of that, some of my eat eat less, move more, is kind of autopilot. I work at home, and there's absolutely no planning in my food. Okay, I get up and there'll be cereal in the cupboards. And then I'll go downstairs and I'll open the fridge and what am I going to have for lunch today? When actually I could spend 10 minutes of my day before I start my work kind of going, what am I going to have for lunch? You know, and lunch is kind of for me the pivotal meal, because if I don't eat enough, I'm going to be snacking through the afternoon. So I and that's the probably the one I'm quite fortunate that my wife enjoys cooking and she'll 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 do much of that work in the house. So lunch is really the the meal that I'm solely responsible for. And more often than not, I can cock that up by just kind of not eating enough or having too much, or it's something that just isn't going to sustain through the day. And then before you know it, I get to half past three and I'm like, I want a snack. Or I'm in a bad mood. And neither one of those is, is is a good place to be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Cool. So, um, we have given ourselves a little bit of leeway and we are now beyond our uh, imposed limit of uh, podcasting time, but um, it's been completely worthwhile um, and we can extend a little bit further for sure. Stu, is there anywhere you wanted to go with with questions while we've got Chris? No, I mean, we. the only thing, uh, we sort of talked about it off air very briefly, didn't we? Uh, and it was, it's it sort of regarding sort of a, my you know uh, mindset as uh, you know i quite obviously have an addictive personality if that's what you want to call it but we've sort of discussed briefly that how i have struggled with with regards to my training my running and it's just i've fallen into sort of the bad habits of not i wouldn't say i became addicted to running but i just i've struggled chris to limit myself you know i will read the books or i will read online and get a basic running plan in my head you know and it will say for example you know two days running one day's rest and and i'll do that for two weeks and i'll feel pretty good but then i'll find myself on that third day you know i might have been in the tractor all day at work and i've been sat down i think right i need to have a run today i need to have a run because it'll be good for my mental health and i go out running But I know I shouldn't go out running. And by the end of the week, I'm overtired and I'm grumpy and I'm grumpy and I'm upset with myself. So it's just guarding against that or how 
do I guard against? I mean, I should know better at my age, you know, and having gone through some of the things, you know, I should be able to say to myself, but I still struggle. Um, and I assume that's probably something I, I wrote in my notes to Phil. People who I assume you have experience of giving someone a weight training program and they look at it and go, oh, are you, you know, I used to lift 50 kilos when I was at university and you're, you're telling me I can only list 15 kilos for the next six weeks. What good's that going to do to me? How, yeah. how, how do, how do you deal with that situation when you, as the professional, you know, it works. If I lift 15 kilos for six weeks, it's going to do me good. How do you convince me it's going to do me good? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think there's a, there's a, there's a key thing there, isn't there? You've got to, I'm a big believer in people, understanding why they're doing what they're doing and what's yeah. happening happening physiologically but but also you know from a from a mental perspective as well and and listen i i you know i wouldn't ever profess to know very much at all about addiction and and so you know the, the advice that i that, that i'm going to give might be you know very difficult to follow for someone that is that is addicted and there are people that get addicted to exercise but are addicted to anything um but i guess i guess you know first thing i'd sort of yeah, like I say, I'm a big believer in, in people understanding what's happening when they train. So the first thing I sort of explain to people about about rest is it's not just to give you a bit of a rest because you're a bit tired. It's actually that what what right what first of all why are we doing this this thing in 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 the first place? Oh, it's to be able to run a marathon, for instance, or is to be able to whatever it is, play a sport. Okay, so you do you care about that thing? And, and you know we ascertain that they care about it and obviously they do care about it because otherwise they wouldn't have committed to doing it it's like okay so so if we're looking at the best possible way of, of 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 getting you to the start line in the best possible shape to be able to run the marathon and for you to run a good time and the time that you want to run there are some things that need to happen here we need to, you to get fitter would you agree with that yeah of course i need to get fitter right what does that mean it means being able to being able to have the endurance to 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 kind of you know to, to get through the 40 kilometers i need to have a certain amount of speed to be able to do that there's a certain amount of strength that's required to prevent against injury and all the rest of it so okay great so how do we get those things and this might seem like really simple questioning but i'm yeah. going to sort them with something in a minute because i'm because they're answering yes to all the things and, and they agree with all these things all these statements so do we need to train yes do we need to do a certain amount of endurance work yes do we need to do a certain amount of strength work yes because why well because we know that these things work okay good right so when you do these training sessions do you know what happens then in the to the body and they're like well yeah this happens and they grow bigger muscles and i might get more capillaries in my blood vessels it's like yeah okay when does that happen well, when i'm training I, actually it doesn't happen then it happens after it happens during your rest okay so i get them to i get them to i, I sort of reframe rest as in and this isn't my quote this is a, a, a good a, a friend of mine who's a, who's a very very good strength coach and he, he he's the first person that i heard sort of quoting this um invisible training it's invisible training that's when all the adaptations to your training take place during rest so rest we need to program this this in as as a thing in the same way that we would do yeah. as part of your running but but understand that it's it's non-negotiable it's to the point where if you were to train over that rest you're now going to get less good results because you've trained during the time when your body should be actually growing and developing so part of it is the education around that um you've mentioned though that you do it for mental health reasons i, I sort of picked that up you know yeah. so you, you're like right I've, I've, Certain, certain, you know, not a hundred percent of the time, but yeah, sure. a lot of the time it will be, I yeah. will head out running for, yeah, uh, to clear the head. Yeah, and a lot of people, the reason they're addicted to exercise is because they feel really good when they do it, and they don't feel so good when they don't do it. Yeah. And I'm a hundred percent in that. I wouldn't say I'm addicted to exercise, but if I'm not exercising regularly, I'm, I'm in a bad mood. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I, I like the feeling. Um, so. I think the, the key thing there is to have is to create a toolbox of things that can achieve the same result in terms of making you feel better from a mental health perspective. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that. And, and one of the things that I do with people is and, and they often feel better when they do this is we actually program in what we call regeneration. So I don't just call it rest, I call it regeneration. And this 
there's a routine they might go through that might involve some breathing and some meditation, but also some, you know, sitting on hard lacrosse balls or cricket balls or tennis balls or whatever, and actually working the muscles that that you're using when you're running to actually loosen off some of the muscles, but also incorporate the breathing with that. And they end up doing those sessions and coming out of those sessions feeling like really sort of zen um, and, and, and relaxed. And, and then, you know, that's actually then something they look forward to doing. So then rest doesn't just become the absence of something. It's yeah. actually there's a purpose to it. So, again, it's, it's about it's some, a lot of this is about reframing things into something yeah. that's positive. So, yeah. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, that that was that five minutes was worth the podcast alone. Fantastic. <laughs> but that five minutes was worth enduring the previous 55. <laughs> <laughs> that, from a very selfish point of view, I have I have been re-educated 100 percent or not re-educated. But that is. Yeah, that's something that 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 I personally will find very useful, Chris. So hopefully, hopefully the other seven people who watch this podcast will as well. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Right. Good. So on that note, I think it's um, uh, we, we are going to draw to a close. Um, so I think firstly, Chris, thanks for giving up your time. Um, we've uh, transferred your uh, your attendance fee into a charity. So but it's very kind of you to, to offer that. So thank you. Um, it has been really, really worthwhile. I think it's kind of kind of uh, put the cherry on the cake on some of the uh, some of the discussions we've had over the last couple of weeks. So really big thank you from us. Um, we've got some of the usuals to do, haven't we, Stu? Uh, so anybody that's watching, listening, uh, we do want to uh, ex extend this uh, this podcast as far as it can go. So like and rate it on you know whatever platform you're watching. If you want to put a comment on, then that'll be really good. Um, Stu, talk us through the coffee. Yes, thing. we have set up. It's just buymeacoffee.com. If you search Henry Westerns on Henry Westerns Old Mate on buymeacoffee.com, you can support the podcast. Uh, it's not supporting my me or Phil. It's not lying in our pockets. It's supporting the podcast going forward. It allows us to buy new things like this mic I have in front of me. Uh, I might buy some Phil some nice backlights uh, in the future. <laughs> 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 but, but yes, if if you know, we we've always said we 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 we're not going to get rich podcasting. We don't want to get rich podcasting. But going forward, if if people want to support the podcast, you can head over to buymeacoffee.com, search HWOM Henry Weston's old mate, and you can donate the cost of one, two, three, or even five cups of coffee. Uh, we've plugged Starbucks, so perhaps we'll plug Costa as well in another podcast but but yes that that's it like rate review uh support the podcast if you want uh that's it phil really great chris you look like you're about to say something only to my son to tell him to get out of the room <laughs> okay <laughs> fine. But, but i'd also like to just say thank you very much for close the door please <laughs> <laughs> didn't pick up the hint there um no, no. thank you very much for having me um been I, I, honestly an absolute pleasure and and you know if you feel like i can add you know add anything in future please you know don't hesitate to give us a shout i'd, I'd happily kind of come on and, and support what you're doing because i think it's a, a you know it's, it's a very very worthy thing to to do and i know that's not the reason why you're doing it but but you know i'm sure it, it is massively helpful to lots of people so yeah would, would always be a pleasure and um yeah, f funny seeing you after 25 plus years, Stu. So, yeah. It's, uh, uh, I'd say it was probably 20. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, probably was 20. Yeah, probably was 20. Anyway, yeah. yeah. I'd like to say you haven't changed very much, but. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I'd have been drunk the last time you saw me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been absolutely brilliant having you on, because, and for me, like you said numerous times, it's not. It's not overly complicated stuff, a lot of what we've talked through today. And if the, the time, it's stuff that we probably all do a lot of in our professional lives uh, yeah. because we have to do, we have to be more time efficient at work, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we've owned, so if we can transfer or if I can transfer some of my efficiency or just learn to be more efficient but like you said i don't think there's much in here that will over that you've described to us that will that 
that all of us can't sort of transfer into our everyday lives, be it meal prep, weekly prep, you know, just making our mornings or evenings slightly more efficient. I think it's been eye opening for me. I've got a page full of notes. Jake Humphreys on the podcast that I listen to a lot always says, oh, I've been taking notes today. I've been taking notes. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much, Chris. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Okay, and we'll see you next time on Henry Weston's Old Mate, The Pod.